So I'm going to grab my column here. Oh, great. I was confused. So 
Sorry about that, guys. Yeah, just for a few minutes. Yeah. 
Sorry guys, keep talking for a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. 
we're going to let our live stream, guys. This is a really high tech live stream, as you can tell. Uh, Kieran, tell us tell us about uh, your multitude of conferences. Right. So, uh, yes. Uh, or at least at least O'Reilly. So first, there's an O'Reilly conference uh, that I am one of the program chairs of. That's January 27th, which is the uh, We have a pretty all star lineup. Many others. Uh, if you use the discount code meetups50, it's 50% off and it's still expensive. Uh, sort of, we thought you know, a lot of people will be coming into the Bay Area. Some of this events, and people are you know, just around. So uh, we're setting up a kind of academic conference the day before. That's January 26th. Uh, I did send an announcement out. I didn't send it to all of you, although um, I guess we can just set it to the meetup. Uh, it's just a sort of call proposal that sets out what the events uh, will more or less be. And the day after the O'Reilly conference, which is January 28th, we'll have uh, some more business and uh, sort of distributed application development focused one day conference. Uh, so the quantified people have uh, donated the physical space at the conference, and they'll be sort of more taking the lead on that. Focus is the business case of. Yeah, tell us, tell us again your uh, role. Yeah, so um, I guess I'm one of the directors of the Cryptocurrency Research Group, along with Talent and uh, Aaron Wright, who's uh, not here. Uh, we do intend to expand the board, but it's just three months from now. Um, and we are focused on solving technical problems, sort of related to cryptocurrency stuff, blockchain scalability to make cards. And we also want to integrate with sort of the legal world, the sociological elements and all this stuff. We want to be sort of generally open academic clearing house for blockchain ideas, blockchain technology. Okay, great. Uh, so here from the meetup as well as me, by the way, my name is Christian Peel. I don't know if I said that or not. We have Andy Atkin, wait, raise your hand. He's a he's one of the organizers. Cayman is the San Francisco guy. Sarah Masari. Uh, all right, Vitalik, is there anybody else we should recognize here? Um, I guess Martin and Joseph are wonderful JavaScript developers. Okay, where are Martin and Joseph? And then I, I just saw one guy raise his hand. Where's, oh, right here. Oh, okay, okay. okay great. <laughs> Sitting in the front row like a good Ethereum. <laughs> Uh, okay, so uh, I think this is a, a great topic, blockchain scalability. So, yeah. Vitalik, please. Perfect. So, blockchain scalability theory. So, I guess I'll just dive right in for simplicity. So, when we talk about, first of all, when we talk about blockchain security, so what, what do we mean by a blockchain in general being secure? So, there's some, there are several important metrics that we, that we can use to measure when, when some blockchains are more secure than others. So first metric is stability. So stability basically means how much does it cost to attack a particular network. So in the, in the case of Bitcoin, the, depending on how you measure it, like one way of measuring it is to say Bitcoin, Bitcoin mining is done by... If you stand just a foot that way, the people that are watching you live can see your face. Sure. I mean, you just need the incompatible objectives. So yeah, I know. That, that mic okay, is not so doing much. So I'm not sure if I move the mic, which yeah, is a short-built strategy that you discovered earlier. Um, okay. So stability is basically how much it takes to, uh, how much money it takes to attack the network. So in the case of Bitcoin, you can think of it as, as I think, roughly between around 50 to $70 million, which is basically the amount of money that you need to purchase or manufacture as many ASICs as the entire network has altogether. So that's, of course, that's one way of measuring it. The other way of measuring it is actually looking to, looking to see how much money how much money you would need to spend to either hack the existing mining companies or mining pools or even to just bribe them. 
And in that case, the value actually ends up being considerably lower than 57 million. So, in, so here it, it actually does become, it does become a bit subjective sometimes when you want to measure stability. But the general idea is that something like Bitcoin takes a, lot, takes a lot of money to watch a particular percent attack against. Whereas some tiny network that's whatever what number one, 137 on coin market cap on um, is, I hope it's not a mistake for this for this example, is uh, you know it might have a market cap of one million dollars and you might be able to attack it by spending just twenty or forty thousand dollars. So stability generally can be measured in uh, or has sort of two sub objectives. So width is basically the number of users that you would need to corrupt in order to Take over, take over a network. So in the case of Bitcoin, it's 51%. Um, in the case of a, in the case of a centralized system, it's exactly one. And you know, there's a bunch of systems that offer different trade-offs in the middle. And the second thing is depth. So depth is basically the size of the disincentive against participating in any kind of attack. So in Bitcoin's case, if you participate in an attack and it fails, then you miss and you produce a block on some fork that doesn't go anywhere then you end up paying 25 BTC, or you end up missing out on this opportunity cost of 25 BTC that you could have earned by mining the block on the main chain. Mean, um, meanwhile, in something like, in some, in some of the very old proof of stake systems, there is this uh, nothing at stake problem, which is that, you know, because it's possible to mine, because it's possible to mine on different chains simultaneously, if you're mining on a fork, you know, there's zero, there's exactly zero disincentive against doing that. So, like a naive, a, a naive proof of stake system, you would have the property that width is, width is still 51%, but depth, on the other hand, is basically zero. So, that's one metric. The other metric is exploitability. So, exploitability basically means, okay, if you succeed in an attack, can you easily profit from the attack? So, if you can succeed and profit from an attack, then even, even if the stability is very high, that could still be bad. Because you know, even if you need a large amount of money to, to, to sort of get over the stability barrier and break the blockchain, if you can earn a profit from it, well, guess what? You can find seventy million dollars from what scrupulous venture capitalists. I mean, I'm sure ISIS will be happy to lend you seventy million if you can maintain the background of forty. So, third is recoverability. So, what are the consequences of an attack? <laughs> Does an attack completely break everything? Is it some, is it something that you know users can? Make, get through without too much disruption, and so and you know ideally we would like the consequences of an, of an attack to be uh, to be lower. Although there is one school of thought that says that we actually want the consequences of an attack to be worse, and the reason is that if an attack hurts everyone, inc then including the attacker, then exploitability goes down, which which might prevent attacks from happening in the first place. So, but in general, you know if if there is some way that we could make attacks smoother for users without making them smoother for attackers, we want to do it. So, what goals do we want? So, stability, you know, we want the width to be at least 25% of participants. That should be a reasonable margin, maybe more. Um, exploit, and the other thing we want is we want a large step. So, as, I, as we mentioned in uh, Naive Proof of Stake, Width is very large, depth is zero, and so technically, in a game theoretic model, it's sort of the whole mechanism is more being secure because it's, because if you're an attacker, you can take over one percent of one percent of the stake. You can bribe everybody else's dollar to put their vote on every fork simultaneously, and then you with your one percent, your fork will always end up winning eventually. So the exploitability ideally zero, but as it turns out, it's, it's Seems like it's probably impossible to make an unexploitable system without some degree of, of, of what I started to call subjectivity, which is actually which is a completely separate topic on it in, in its own right. It probably, probably deserves a, a presentation, but might not have time to fully get into it. Uh, Vlad Zamfir, one of our wonderful researchers, who's spent a lot of a lot of time thinking about this stuff, and will. I believe soon may soon make some write-ups, right? You're planning on you're planning on making some documents about proof of stake, right, Vlad? Okay. Um, recoverability. You know, you do, one of the situations that you don't want is you don't want a situation where there, an attack happens and then that has these really really messy consequences where an entire system has to be overburdened for half a day. So those are the metrics of security. Metrics of scalability. 
So there's two metrics that are, I think, important. And so one metric is efficiency. So efficiency basically is the cost of processing of a transaction. So right now in Bitcoin, the cost of processing a transaction is somewhere around a couple of cents. And if you don't want to try to measure things economically, another sort of proxy measurement that you could use is you can try to measure the number of nodes that process each transaction. So in Bitcoin, I think there's somewhere like 2,000 to 3,000 full nodes, and there's probably a bunch more nodes that end up, nodes that end up processing transactions after the fact. Um, and so, you know, the problem with what you know, blockchain architectures is, of course, when every node in the network has to process every transaction, you have to either have very few nodes, in which case you have centralization, or you have very many nodes, in which case the thing is extremely unscalable. So full node size. So here, the, the, what we want out of full node size, basically, the computational requirements of the largest kind of node that needs to exist. So in Bitcoin, there is this concept of like clients. And what like clients do is they basically use uh, uh, this, these Merkle tree mechanisms to be able and to be able to process proofs that a particular that a few particular transactions occurred without actually having having to verify the entire blockchain. So it's a nice mechanism because you know if you can't afford to download the 27 gigabyte blockchain if you're just on a smartphone or if you're on uh, some kind of Internet of Things device then you want to be able to securely see you know, whether a particular transaction got processed, what the current state of your account is, and so forth. And so like client protocols will let you do that. However, they're not a full solution because even if a network can't exist on nothing but like clients. Full nodes still have to exist. And so the metric that we're trying to target here is, you know, what is it possible to create a to create a, a blockchain mechanism that works without having everything, any node process every transaction. So computational requirements, there is computation, you know, plain old, like, plain old number crunching, uh, there is storage, how much hard disk space, and there's bandwidth. And bandwidth is just passive messages across the network. So current situation is that there's, so, Bitcoin blockchain by itself, fairly simple. There's a, it's a single blockchain. Every node on the network processes every transaction. So it gives you full security, or at least it gives you a very high degree of stability because you need 51% in, in order to attack the network. And, well, I mean, there are some more subtle classes of attacks that work starting at around 25 to 33%, but in general, like 51% is, is a sort of absolute margin. Um, and, but you have this efficiency penalty. Then the, so that's Bitcoin. Then what's the alternative to Bitcoin? Well, let's think of altcoins. Now, I don't mean like Litecoin, Litecoin has an alternative to Bitcoin or Dogecoin has an alternative to Bitcoin. I mean the entire category of altcoins together. You know, what if we say, in order to have scalability, we will make many, many coins. They'll all be exactly identical. And so you'll send your coins on Bitcoin 645 or Bitcoin 6713. So if you have a thousand of these mini, of these altcoins, Every node processes a thousand, one over a thousand of all transactions, a thousand times more scalable, yay, but you have one over n as much stability. So every single blockchain is going to be a thousand times weaker, and so one of them could be overpowered with a, as little as $70,000. And it could be overpowered profitably with as little as $70,000. And so, you know, it's a problem. So. What goals do we want out of scale in the blockchain architecture? You know, ideally we want to have a system that has the best of both worlds. So one goal is maintain a, maintain at least you know, a quarter of stability. So mean, or a quarter of which point of stability. So we want to still maintain a system where an attacker needs to have, let's say, at least 25% of some kind of you know, participation in the system in order to you know, successfully attack it. We want to increase efficiency, say instead of having thousands of nodes process every transaction, we want to go down to 200. And we want to have a sublinear full node size, ideally. So we don't even want to say, okay, well, every node has to process 10% of all transactions or 1% of all transactions. We want to even make it go sublinear. So square root of n, if there's a thousand transactions, every node, every node might have to only process 31. If there's a million transactions, every node will only have to process 1,000 and so forth. So if you try, if you if we can manage to make this kind of asymptotic bound, then you know it becomes much more much more scalable in the long run, and the margin that we get over a single blockchain just keeps on increasing and increasing. 
as the as usage keeps on going up. So one controversy is this sort of sublinear full node size property necessary? As, you know, there are approaches, there are some approaches to scalability. So for example, if you look at the Bitcoin Foundation scalability roadmap, or if you or if you look at some of the ideas that people that you know, people in BitShares are having and a few other projects, they're basically saying, well, we'll just keep the single blockchain architecture. We'll make sure like like clients can work well. You know, we'll use some constant factor tricks like invertible room we'll lookup tables to make things more bearable. And but we're just going to say the blockchain is just going to keep growing. Eventually, the blockchain will go really big. If you, you know, if you don't want to download it, just use a light client. So, if you assume two, so if you assume, let's say, two transactions per day per user globally, seven billion people in the world. This is, let's say, 2030. All of them have been magically lifted out of poverty because either cryptocurrency is so awesome, or because you know there's a lot of other technological progress that's happening, and and Everyone wants to make two payments a day. So two payments a day per person, 14 billion payments a day, goes to about 97 million transactions a block in Bitcoin. Um, assuming, each, assuming each of those 14 billion transactions was on average 200 bytes, we got 2.7 terabytes a day of data. And, and with Bitcoin, I believe the ratio of like stored state to uh, so the ratio of data that you actually have to store to, the, to all the transactions you have to process is somewhere around 1 to 10. I mean, it could be a bit off. It could be like 1 to 20, 1 to 30. I'm not, I'm not completely sure. But if it's 1 to 10, then 280 gigabytes uh, per day of stuff that you have to increase your hard drive by. If it's 1 to 30, if, uh, if the ratio is more favorable, like 1 to 30, then it might be something like 90 gigabytes a day. Now, that's for payment processing. So, it, you know, 280 gigabytes a day. If you take current hard drives and you apply, say, 10, you know, 10 or 20 years of more to a lot of them, then maybe you could see how this kind of works for payment processing, maybe. So, but the issue is, is that you know we at Ethereum and are interested in blockchains, not just for currency, but also for decentralized application more generally, and so. If people, if we want people to use blockchains for, you know, things like all these different name registration applications, all these var all these various uh, various decent decentralized apps, you know, store account usernames on on the blockchain. Eventually, they like, can run entire, like run more something close to more traditional programs on it. Then, even if you assume 200 transactions per day per user globally, that's 280 terabytes a day of data. And 28 terabytes a day of stored state. So this is looking much less viable for you know full, for full nodes to be able to uh, to be able to store. So of course, what is going to happen here? So one thing that could happen is that you, ha as the blockchain grows and grows, you know eventually you're just going to see users start dropping out of uh, uh, deciding to drop out from the info nodes and just saying, okay, screw it, I'm going to be a light client, or screw it, I'm going to trust the servers that blockchain that info. Or, you know, if you don't trust blockchain that info, okay, well, I'm going to trust the servers that hello block dial with that for next guys. So if, you know, if that happens, then eventually, you know, you'll see only maybe businesses running full, running full nodes, then eventually then only, only large mining pools, then some of the mining pools, with smaller mining pools will start subcontracting contracting out to bigger mining pools. And you might end up with this annoying situation where there's just actually a very small number of phone nodes that the entire network relies on. And then guess what? You've reached your decentralization. And you know, if you go all the way to one node running the thing, then that one node is basically like PayPal. So that's based in if you don't like centralization, then you know this just making things bigger and bit and, and if you don't like centralization and you believe that blockchain will be used for a whole bunch more stuff. Then I like, believe you really can't just you know keep on sticking with this one block full blockchain paradigm forever. But on the other hand, if you have a more restrictive vision of the blockchain as just being used for eventual settlement of large amounts of money, then it's a perfectly fine model. So one approach is uh, merge mining. So the idea here is that Bitcoin miners can mine and other chains at the same time. So Bitcoin miners can also like simultaneously. So there's a way that they can sort of share block headers and almost. So Bitcoin miners are like simultaneously mining Litecoin headers and uh, 
or I mean, not like rate headers actually, because like there's a different algorithm, but name point is worth money with Bitcoin, and I think there's a few others that uh, I know a blockchain is quite, uh, has, has been trotting out the idea of having their side chains more money with Bitcoin. So one problem with uh, Bitcoin with merge mining is that there's is that there's no is that there's no if you are not participating in merge mining a particular point, there's no incentive not to attack it. So the thing is that if you are mining Bitcoin, the whole idea of merge mining is that well we want it to be free to to, to merge mine all these other coins at the same time in order to encourage everyone to do it. So we'll have Bitcoin miners, and we'll have and then we'll just, you know, I think something like 40% of Bitcoin miners mine main point. I think it's back in 20, 2011 or 2012, I don't know what it is right now. And But the problem is that if, let's say, you have a somewhat less popular coin, and let's say you have 5 or 10% of Bitcoin miners who are mining it, now let's say there's a bigger, there's a mining pool that really doesn't like your coin and wants to see your coin destroyed. So what will that mining pool do? That mining pool will, while, at the same time as as it continues peacefully mining Bitcoin, it can 51% attack your little merge mining coin, and it does so. And if this attack fails, the merge the the, the mining pool pays no cost. And if the attack succeeds, then the mining pool gets a yes or nice extra revenue and it deprives other other miners of revenue. So this isn't just theoretical; it actually happens. There's a mining pool called Oligias that. A while ago, made the 51% attack on a coin that was more like a Bitcoin that's called Coil Coin, and you know since then there hasn't really been that much interest in merge mining in uh, on the part of you all coins in merge mining. That's one problem. Second problem is well, actually before we get to this this second problem, again another political problem, which is that if you rely on merge mining, then you could reasonably argue that it compromises the provisionless nature of the of the cryptocurrency ecosystem, because if let's say we we agree for security all coins are going to be merge mined, then let's say I start up my own coin. If if in order for my coin to get admitted into the system, it would have to get approved by a majority of mining pools, and if it does not get approved, then I will then it will have a, you know might be mined by say 15 percent of Bitcoin miners, and then other Bitcoin miners will be able to cautiously attack it. So it creates a situation where you know it's it could be very potentially become turned into this sort of closed environment, closed environment that's kind of you know heavily heavily restricted entry again against new chains. And so you know I mean once again not not entirely theoretical. Like if you look at the world of Metacoin, if you look at projects like Maxicoin and Counterparty, you know there have been you know there have there. Are, is a strong subset of Bitcoin developers that, act, that actively try to make things like the, to make things like the master point and counter, master point and counterparty more difficult to run on Bitcoin. Like the origin, like originally, uh, actually, even Ethereum itself, back before we before we decided to, to become an independent blockchain, we wanted to be a Metacoin on top of Primecoin. And why we wanted to be on top of Primecoin instead of being on top of Bitcoin? Because there was this concern that Bitcoin developers were trying to like for, or, or trying like institute rules to prevent counterparty transactions from getting into the Bitcoin blockchain, and and rather just avoid that. So then the last problem is full node size. On, is that the full, you know the thing, one of the key things that we were looking for from scalability is what is the maximum size of a full node? Here the size of a full node is unchanged because if let's say by D, let's say you do the one blockchain approach. You have a thousand, you have a thousand, uh, tr or one blockchain, thousand transactions a block. Okay, every full node has to process a thousand transactions a block. Now let's say we adopt merge mining for scalability. Yay! Now we have ten blockchains, each of them process a hundred transactions a block. Well, guess what? If you're merge mining all ten of them, then you have to process a, a hundred times ten equals a thousand transactions every block. <coughs> now, you could say what. Well, uh, okay, we're only going to have, let's say, half of the mine, half or a third of the miners process uh, process every individual uh, every individual block in these merge mine chains. But then, once you if you're doing that, then you gain you know the x scalability, but you also sacrifice the x number. So that's the, the, those are basically the problems with merge mining generally. And then proto scalability. There are scalability approaches that work well for specific applications. So if I'm sending you 0.01 cents so, uh, several hundred times a day, then it makes sense to open up this thing called a micropayment channel. 
where basically I put I put some Bitcoin into this multi-sig and then simultaneously make a transaction sending them all back to me. And then if I want to pay you, then I sort of substitute that transaction with a new transaction that pays a little less to me and a little more to you, and then keep on updating like that. And only when the channel is done do I actually have to finalize. And then the whole mechanism can process an arbitrary number of payments which is two Bitcoin transactions. Um, and then you could do things, and then there's this approach to called pub and spoke micropayments, where there's a bunch of micropayment hubs. And the idea is that you sort of, if you want to pay someone else, and you would sort of do a bit of it, find some pathway of micropayment channels going from you to some node to some other node to some other node to them. So it's kind of like instituting a ripple like thing on top of Bitcoin. Um, probabilistic micropayments, basically, if you want to pay someone 0 0.5 cents, you would do something which provably has a 0 0.5% chance of sending them a dollar. Um, auditable computation. The so the idea here is that if he wants to try to like do very very expensive verification or auditing on the blockchain, then the way you do it is you sort of do the code, you put the code onto the blockchain, but you don't run the code on the blockchain. Instead, you run it off chain by default, and you allow anyone anyone to run the computation and provide the result along with a security deposit. And then when they provide that result. Result, there is a period of time during which anyone else can audit the code, run it themselves. If they discover that, that the result that the first person provided is wrong, then what they can do is they can provide their contradictory result, put down their own security deposit, and then, the, then only then, the code would actually run entirely on the blockchain, and whoever provided the correct answer would get both security deposits minus the fee, which would end up being very large. So the idea here is that you would have the, the code would not be run on the blockchain by default, but you have this mechanism that sort of threatens to run the code on the blockchain. And from a game theoretic perspective, the incentive sort of propagates back and ensures that people have the incentive to act on this way as if the code is run on the blockchain completely. So there's a couple of these sort of single issue approaches that work very well for some things. So in general, sort of what are the fundamental trade-offs of scalability? You know, what are the fundamental trade-offs between big blockchain, thousand small blockchains, <laughs> to sort of some of these word planning approaches? So the issue is that you need many nodes that are sort of protecting every transaction in some sense. Now, you know, in Bitcoin, every single node processes every transaction. If you have, you know, if you only have a few nodes process every transaction, then they might end up polluted. Otherwise, so you sacrifice decentralization or security. But the more nodes watch every transaction, the less scalability you have. So the goal of scalability, at least as I see it, is to have as many nodes as possible implicitly protecting every transaction with as few nodes as possible explicitly signing off on it. So not going to explain it now, but you'll probably kind of get an idea of what it means from some of the examples. So okay, unfortunately, unfortunately this present presentation open office seems to have completely failed at carrying over uh, carrying over the pictures that I meant to have here. But I'll explain. So hub and spoke. The idea here is that you would have like many blockchains in this hub and spoke pattern, and they're kind of merge mined with each other in the sense that if you mine on one, so this is one currency, and they're all merge mined with each other. So if you mine, so what, as a miner, you would be mining on one spoke, and when when you're mining on a spoke, what you're doing is you're processing transactions on that spoke, and you're also moving coins or sending messages from uh, from the spoke to the hub and from the hub to the spoke. So if I wanted to send some coins from hub number five to hub number 17, I would first send a transaction moving them, or from spoke number five to spoke number 17, I would first send a transaction moving them from hub number five, uh, from spoke number five to the hub, and then from the hub to spoke number 17. So the idea here is that this kind of mechanism is nice for, is nice if you want to have a, if you have a system where you have a large number of different decentralized apps, and most of these apps sort of lead each other along and keep to themselves, and you only need a limited amount of interaction. So if you imagine, you know, there is like decentralized Uber running on spoke number five, decentralized Dropbox on number, on number seven, some other some other thing on eleven, and so forth, and mo and the mostly closed ecosystems, but some of the time you want transactions that are you know coming over from one to the other. Or you want messages that are coming over from one contract to another, but you could also you could also send messages from a contract on one on one. Yes. Uh, this sounds somewhat familiar, somewhat similar to the side chains. Um, it's not quite the same. So, 
it's not quite the same thing as well. It's kind, of, it's vaguely similar to to Northline sidechain uh, sidechains in, in some ways, although it's uh, a somewhat you know, it's it's a somewhat different worth mining algorithm because the the idea here is basically that well, so you would have a, so you would have a hub and right so so I guess the uh, Yeah, it's it's sim it's it is sim it is similar in some ways, but it kind of I guess I'll just finish it finish off finish explaining the other we'll see. So if you're mining on one spoke, you you process transactions on it. You process transactions on the spoke and move and move messages to the hub. And the diagram basically here is that if you make a, so if you make a block header, then that block header would point would have to point to the previous header. Or it would, uh, would point to the previous header generated in the entire system, and it would also have to point to the previous header on the on the same spoke. So basically, like there's sort of blockchain on each individual spoke, and then there's this big hub, and all the hub is is just the collection of all the different block headers that are stuck put together. So <coughs> if you assume that the attacker has 80% strength on one fork, then so you know the attacker grabs a bunch of a bunch of nodes, decides they're just going to try really really hard to work on it to come on a single fork. Then let's suppose that the attacker tries to revert history. So the attack so basically the attacker tries to do a scan to the percent attack. That's going to fail because all the spokes are merge mined and so they share security. So you know basically the attacker would actually have to overpower not just his own spoke but all the other spokes. Case number two, the attacker tries to submit an invalid block. So the problem is that if I submit an invalid block on one chain, then uh, the issue is then what's the issue is that I is that the you know if there's a block that's invalid that's on chain five, everyone that's on chain five is going to see it. But then if I'm on chain eleven, I don't get all I don't get the blocks on chain five, I just get the block headers. And so how am I going to see this invalid? Well, guess what? If a block is invalid and all the data is there, then you can do one of these Merkle tree link line proofs. And you can actually construct a compact proof that the block is invalid, pass it around, and then everyone will, everyone will never will see that it's invalid. Right. So the difference between this whole thing and merge mine and merge mine side chaining is uh, uh, basically that in over here what you would have what you, you, what, you, what you have is you have is the consensus rule is that the main is that the main if in the main chain even a single block along any spoke is invalid, then that entire main chain from there becomes invalid. Meanwhile, with uh, with worse mining, the thing is that if you if you are in the Bitcoin blockchain and you as a merge you as a merge miner create merge mine in such a and you say and you make or and you make a block, a Bitcoin block, which points, which points to an in, a valid Bitcoin block. If so you make a, a valid Bitcoin block, which is an invalid namecoin block, then the thing is that the Bitcoin system is not aware of the namecoin rules, and so Bitcoin is just going to keep on chugging along, and namecoin kind of sits there on its own, right? So, whereas here in this system, if you have, a, if let's say an attacker submits a, an invalid block on chain five, then somehow this proof of invalidity thing doesn't work for a while, and then the chain, and then more people put, put put blocks on top of put headers on top of that invalid header, and then someone just someone discovers later on that hey this block down here is invalid. The entire thing is going to get reverted. So so the rules basically say that everything above that 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 thing that became, that, that became an error is suddenly invalid. So. The benefits of and the one weakness of doing that is that obviously you know you have a bit less recoverability because if there's even if there's this one mistake then it could lead to over a large revert for the entire system. But the be the benefit is that there there's there isn't this uh, there isn't this issue that like if this if you try to do this similar thing so in this mechanism one key point is that if you have let's say ten spokes. Only 10% of all the miners mine on each spoke, right? So if you do it with merge mining, the thing is that you actually could, right? So you actually could uh, do a re do a rewrite on a single right. spoke, and if you, or you could like do a, a do a 51% attack on a, uh, on, a say, on a single spoke, and if you're more powerful than 10%, then within the context of that single spoke, you would actually win. 
whereas here everything is sort of much more much more tightly bound together. It's basically like inwards mining. The child is not aware is aware of the parent, but the parent is not aware of the child. Here, the child is aware of the parent. The parent is aware of the child. Yeah. So, is this uh, is this basically side chains plus merge mining, uh, and then maybe one other thing packed on? Yeah, right. Yeah, that's one way of describing it. It's it's kind of a modification. Like, yeah, so the idea here is that the other thing that gets stacked on the side chains plus for lighting is basically that the, the, central block, the central blockchain is aware of the rules for all of its children. So, like, in, like with merge mining by itself, if an invalid block gets in, the Bitcoin blockchain doesn't really care about that, right? Whereas in, in this model, it does. That's basically the only difference. So how is it aware of all the rules? Well, because all of the chains, so, because all of the chains here have the exact same rules. So this is all a single protocol. It's not like it's not like a way for any it's not a thing that anyone can join. Or it's not a thing that any protocol can join. Is is the central uh, hub um, essentially like Ethereum? Is that why it's um, no central hub no. so the AT here is not like the central hub. Not quite. So the AT here is that let's say you're designing a blockchain protocol. And you want your block, your protocol to be scalable, then as part of the protocol rules, you would immediately set up 16 of these blockchains, or say 100 of these blockchains, or however many you want, and you would and you would simultaneously set them, uh, and you would have set up the rules so that this hub is like the combination of all of them. Meanwhile, with merge mining, what you're doing is you start off with one blockchain, and then later on you're sort of taking one of those blockchains and those blockchains can have whatever. How does somebody join this hub and spoke model? So you cannot join the hub and spoke model here. It's uh, all of the spokes are instantiated at the beginning, and you could have a protocol rule for what for how the number of spokes could be increased, but it's not a free entry thing. Every single thing in this mechanism has to follow the exact same rules. Yes. Could you apply some recursion to that? So at the end of a spoke, you have another hub. Yeah. So if you sort of take that to the extreme, you would get your bus tree chains. Is what, uh, is what I'm eventually going to get at. So that's right. So the problem. So the problem. So the problem here is that you know if an attacker if an attacker tries to rewrite history, then because everything is actually merge mine, because every because the, the the consensus rules are such that like every header is all. Right, so that's so that's actually the other thing is that like in this in this mechanism you can't like in merge mining you can't have like a battle you can't have like a battle over two different name point forks happening inside of the Bitcoin blockchain. Here you can't do that. So here the rules explicitly say that you know if there's one particular if if in this header chain there is one header for let's say spoke number five block number ten thousand four hundred then you cannot then the next the next the next header associated with spoke number five in the system would have to have number 10,401 and would have to reference that guy as a parent. So you can't like have two, you can't have like two different forks start battling it out inside the header chain. So that's another difference. So the um, so yeah so so tree chains rather than side chains is I guess a, a way of thinking about this. So. Case number three, so the sort of more problematic case is what if an attacker submits a block that has incomplete data? So the problem is you can't produce, so the problem is that you can't produce a proof of invalidity. So let's say I make a block and that block contains just a block header and there's a Merkle tree, but I only I only pr provide some of the data in that Merkle tree. So I provide some I provide some of the transactions, I don't provide other transactions. Now and let's now that block could be valid or it could not be valid. But well, the problem is that if you, you know, information theoretically, you can say that because the, the attacker has not published the data, you can't know and you can't prove it either way. So you can't produce, so the block is not valid, and yet you can't produce a proof that it's invalid. So basically, the only solution here is this challenge with one protocol strategy. So the idea here is that if a block is missing data, then any node can produce a challenge. Now, if a node produces a challenge, then other nodes can then, and a challenge basically says, Hey, I think this piece of data in the block is missing. If a node produces a challenge, then other, when another node receives the challenge, so 
if it receives a challenge, then it would say okay, or if a node receives a challenge, then it would, then some node would have to provide a response. And a response actually is a verbal true true that that particular part of the block is valid. So if you do that, then or if a node receives a challenge and a node receives a response, then everything's fine, okay. If a node receives a challenge and it asks for responses and it doesn't get a response, then after some period of time it would, it would, it would start considering the block suspicious and it, would, and it would eventually discard it. So that's basically the idea here. So challenges of this particular mechanism, number one, fragility. So during a network attack, challenges, so if there is some attack on the network, then you might have a situation where challenges just don't get through for a really long time. Um, there's just a problem that if you can sort of do a DDoS on the network by doing a whole bunch of challenges, if, and if it don't get responded enough, that might screw around with a bunch of nodes. You know, if you try and solve this with proof of work, then the problem is you have a disincentive against making these challenges in the first place. And it has this robustness flaw that, you know, if something bad happens, then you have to revert just to it. If something bad happens on even one spoke, then you have to revert everything in the entire system. So, Hypercube is the sort of ex is my sort of way of expanding hub and spoke. So, instead of do instead of doing recursion on the hub and spoke level, I'm doing recursion on these dimensions essentially. So the idea here is that the hub and spoke problem the, the problem that it has is this low interop low interoperability. So it does have interoperability. You know, a contract on, on spoke number five can't, can send a message to a contract on spoke number 17. That works. The problem is, though, that every single, that every single transaction that does go, go across from one spoke to another, every single node has to process that because that transaction goes through the hub. So basically, you know, so this, I mean, as I was saying, hub and spoke works fine if you have things that are mostly independent from each other, but if you have things that are much more dependent on each other, then in the worst case, it has properties that are equivalent to it. So the intuition with Hypercube is basically that you know, instead of having spokes arranged in a, in a, in a, instead of having vertices arranged in a hub and spoke pattern, you would have vertices arranged in this Hypercube. And the idea is that coins and messages can actually travel along edges. So instead of mining a vertex, you would mine an edge. And when you're mining an edge, you would you would be able to process transactions on one vertex, on the other vertex, and also on the edge, on the edge going, send the messages on the edge going across them. And so if you want to send a coin from here, if you want to send a coin, send a message from here to here, then you would send it from here to here first, and maybe then from here to here, then from here to here, and it would eventually you know, make, make its way over. Yes? Is the number of nodes or vertices uh, fixed? Um, so there's, two, there's different ways of doing it. One way is to say that it's fixed. Um, the other way is actually is to have a mechanism where once a certain threshold of transactions gets triggered, it would automatically like add an, add an, add an extra dimension, and it would sort of keep growing in that way. And what's being stored on these chains? So each vertex, it's, you can think of each vertex as being kind of like its own Bitcoin or its own Ethereum or whatever. So on each vertex, you would be, you would be storing all the accounts, you would be storing contracts, balances, and so forth. And then so you could sense transactions that just do stuff inside of one vertex. And if that happens, then all you're really doing is you're just you're doing the exact same stuff you would do in plain in plain old Ethereum or plain old Bitcoin. Or the other thing that you could do is you could a, there would be an opcode in which a contract would be able to send a message and when it, to a contract on another chain. And that would just be a one-way thing. Basically, the message would sort of go into the outbox and then it would get and then we get propagated over, propagated over to another vertex, and to another vertex, and eventually get to a destination. So you could think of it as kind of like a routing protocol going across these vertices. So basically, if the data associated with each vertex would use these accounts, and it would be this sort of outbox. So yeah. then, are you, are you essentially uh, taking the blockchain and like dividing it, yeah. like chopping it up into bits? Basically. And then distributing the distributed thing? Yeah. And so, so nodes, then it sounds like nodes would be agnostic of what's actually being stored there. Ooh, like what do you mean by agnostic? Like, um, Earlier you talked about that uh, chains, I mean, the, the chains wouldn't be specific to a particular application. Right, each, so, each mean, chain. Or the, so this is so this is still a protocol that's like, specific. this is still a protocol where everything is, or like everything has to follow one protocol. 
So I am going to I am going to show something later on which actually does allow us different completely different protocols to work together. But this is I mean like um, one node. Yes. A, a server somewhere yes. would have to make a decision of which one of these chains it's going to be mining on, right? Right. Well, it would make a decision of which edge it's mining on. So an edge is just two chains that are beside each other. Okay, so two chains. So we have yep. to make that decision. Yeah. Um, but the way you're describing it, it sounds to me like, well, first of all, it sounds to me like there's no reason for it to prefer one chain over another. Correct. If that's the case, how is it going to choose what chain it's going to pick? Is it just so the idea here would reverse? be that you would just you would have a constant you would have a constant block reward on each chain, and so if one chain has fewer miners than other chains, then it, there's the incentive to join that chain. But then, how do you transfer all that data over? What do you mean transfer all of it? Oh, you mean like if you want to switch from one chain to another, basically? How right. do you transfer? Um, you would basically just download you would just download some browser releases a lot, and you. So, yeah, you would, so you would end up like down. So, if so, the general protocol is that if you're starting from just in general, the way that you if you start from Genesis, right, the way that you would valid the way that you as a as a as a full node would participate on the system is you would pick two edges, you would validate everything on those two edges, and then there was also there's also still this sort of header chain in the middle, right, just with, just as before. And then you would validate all. You would just do all the basic validation on the headers from the header chain. And then there would still be maybe these challenges. There would still be challenges coming along. And you would like try to do probabilistic validation. You would maybe do some challenges yourself. And you would so you might choose to like randomly validate one percent of things that are happening everywhere else with zero point one percent or whatever. And so and that's basically and if you do this validation and nothing and nothing comes up, then you assume that and you see all this proof of work, then you assume that the whole thing is probably trusted. So you as a node, so if you were to start in the middle, then basically what you would do is you would get you would get the, you would grab the entire header chain, you would see that there's a bunch of proof of work, then you would start off from the state, or you you would you would grab the state, you would grab the header for the the last header from for the particular two vertices that you care about. From those headers you would download the state for for the for those particular vertices, and you would and then you would go from there and then you'd start. Just you know, probabilistically spot checking everything that happened before. But make sense? Uh, I'll probably need to pay for um, So there's right. And I did write a blog post on on a lot of these things. So like in general, the way a lot of these back the way all of these mechanisms work, right, is that you're a full node on a small part of the state, and then you're a light node everywhere else. That's basically how. And it's basically how all of these all of these mechanisms work. And so the way that you act as a light node generally, right, is you download the is you download the headers, and then when you download the headers, you would like to do some random spot checks. And the theory behind the spot checks is that if there's a few thousand nodes doing random spot checks, then one of them, if there's a problem, then one of them is going to find it, and that one will just broadcast the problem to everything else, to everyone else. Okay. Well, have you solved? Uh... Just the Bitcoin scalability problem. So this is, um, I mean, this is a design that's, I mean, it's designed around Ethereum-like systems, but you, you could do it around the Bitcoin-like system as well. I mean, just the amount of data that you showed, which was I don't remember 28 terabytes of data or something like that. So, is, is so from a complex, right? So from a uh, complex and theoretic perspective, the map. So to, <coughs> right? So there's, uh, so over here, actually. Okay, 200 nodes is actually something for a later version, but in general, the maximum node size is going to be square root of n, right? Basically, because if you set if you set up a system so that you would increase the dimension when the number of transactions per vertex exceeds the number of vertices, then if you say you have a million transactions per epoch, then you would end up having a thousand vertices, and each vertex would end up having a thousand transactions. So. If we were to go to doing this, so in, in the Bitcoin case, I mentioned there would be 100 million transactions every block. So if you do it this way, then you'd have 10,000 transactions per, per vertex, and you'd have 10,000 vertices. So that's. So, so how would clients uh, choose a vertex? Um, so several ways. So if you don't if you don't particularly care, then you would just choose randomly. If there is some particular adapt that you really like. And then you would then you would choose the vertex that's associated with that DAP. Um, if there if you're a miner, then you would like to go around and check and find which one's the choice. So 
in this scenario, would it be the case that people would have their coins spread across all of these various different nodes? Um, so there's several ways of doing it. So if, if you personally are completely agnostic about what you want to use, then the right, right thing to do for you for just for simplicity would be to keep all your coins on one, on one vertex. And then from that one vertex, if you want to pay someone, then you would do this sort of cross-chain payment thing along the edges. And the reason why, and when you're doing it along edges, basically, you know, each time, each time, each one of those transactions will, will only get processed by a very small part of the entire set of people. If you, if you know that you're going to be spending a lot of your time making payments to a specific application or to a specific, like, in general, like, groups of people that pay, that, that make transactions, or groups of people, groups of dApps or whatever that, that make transactions to each other often, have the incentive to organize on the same vertex. And so if you're, if you're on the, if you're, Planning on tracking with a while you're running. Maybe. Yes. Does the fact does that fact actually make coins that are on a particular vertex in some sense more like a vertex that has a popular app more valuable because um, they don't have to go through this process of right. slowly transferring a lot of edges to get to their destination? They might be like 1.0001x is valuable, but the thing is that if they become substantially more valuable, then you know you could do arbitrage because transactions these days aren't percentage based; they're based on their static amounts. And so, if you have a million dollars on this chain, it's one percent more valuable. And if you use a dollar, then you transfer your million your million dollars worth of to, to, the, to the, the chain where they're where they're uh, where where they're more valuable, and then you would sell them there, and you'd like collect one percent profit. So, like in general. In general, with all these mechanisms, like are, you don't, you, you actually don't need that much interoperability in order to achieve, in order to like have fungibility. You just need just enough arbitrage to work. Yes. Why not make it deterministic? What do you mean deterministic? So, like they don't have a choice; it's just chosen for them by the algorithm. Right. So that's actually the next mecha mechanism that I'm going to get through. Though, and it's actually, and it actually does have some very nice properties. Yes. Is what he's talking about deterministically choosing what node you're going to be sending transactions to? Is that what that's um, I'll get to it. Might not be what I had in mind, but it. so so the idea behind tree chains, sort of in this model, is that you would reduce the hub and spoke to two vertices, and you're sort of stack the steam on top of itself many times. And if you sort of take a more purist take, uh, purist take on how Peter Todd envisions it, then you would say that the only possible operation is passing messages cross state. So the only operation is passing messages from a spoke to a hub, from a hub to a higher hub, and so forth. So a you know, tree change basically does sort of fit into this this taxonomy in a in a, in a sort of particular way. And you could combine the mechanism, but right? you could actually combine the hypercube with a with, with a tree, and you and you basically have, have like two levels of stacks up to and that's completely possible. Um, the general, I mean, there are obviously trade-offs. So here with tree chains, the thing is, if you want to send a transaction from like one, you know, from, from one part of the state to somewhere completely different, then it might, it might be more expensive you have to sort of, if you have to sort of pass through the middle vertex. And, but, you know, it has, its advantages are simplicity. Um, it's, I mean, it's a very good, it's a very good system specifically for a currency, whereas, the stuff that I'm designing is like more optimized for the decentralized computer application things. So Hypercube version two. So this is actually a more, it's unfortunately it's a system that only works with proof of stake. Now you could make it based on proof of work by saying, okay, if you, if you do proof of work, then you, then you sort of generate units of a, units of a sort of virtual, uh, first virtual token, and then that's not transferable, and then you would just do proof of stake on that particular token, but then you'd be having to expand it to work without any of the advantages, really. So think of it as a proof of stake system. So for every block on any vertex, you would randomly select 200, you would randomly select 200 signers from the entire state, so from all the vertices. And then in order for that block to be valid, it has to be signed by two thirds of them. Basically it. So one question is, well, if I'm on this vertex, if I'm on one vertex and then I'm assigned, I'm assigned this block that's on these two other vertices, vertices that I've never seen before, how am I going to validate that I don't have the data? And the answer basically is that every block has to come with a local tree. So that's what, 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 uh, what, like with, or not with, with a Merkle tree, but like with the complete subset of Merkle nodes that's involved in performing whatever update, whatever update is doing. And so the theory is that because 
in order for a miner to get a slot validated, it would have to like throw this data around to 200 nodes and so the data would sort of be available on the network. So validity requires uh, like two thirds of the signatures, proof of state, uh, proof of stake only because of proof of work. Like you can't select 200 random miners because there's no way to tell which miner work is coming from. Whereas a proof of stake, stake is inside the system so you can't tell. So why are we, so why are, why is this, is this thing potentially desirable? Why is this idea of like automatically assigning the validators for each block useful? So I will get to that. But first, so the way I'll get to that is I'll describe the key two principles behind all these mechanisms that I described. So first principle is escalation. So in general, so the problem is how do you get around this issue that, well, a system's insecure if, uh, if only a few nodes watch every transaction, but if every node watches every transaction, it's unscalable. So the idea is that if you, only a few nodes pay attention by default, if a node raises the alarm, then more nodes would have to be, would start paying attention to it. So the analogy that I often make here is to the court system. So the analogy here, so you, yeah? Our, our court system is kind of flooded with cases that take full time process. Right, so that's, I mean, that's because of, of a, I mean, that's because of the specific complex complexities of the legal system and the fact that law is highly subjective, whereas... Why? Well, I mean, wouldn't this be susceptible to uh, DDoS if uh, you raise so, the alarm all the time? The, so the idea is that raising the alarm would have to have some kind of cost, and there would have to be some threshold of nodes that would have to raise the alarm here. So, the, so like you would have some... So, the idea, so at the bottom, like you might be able to fairly easily DDoS the bottom levels, but then if something, if an alarm is if an alarm is raised, then the alarm is sort of goes goes off a sufficient level, then it gets harder and harder and harder to raise it at some point. So you know you might be able to exhaust it at you might be able to significantly lower the efficiency of it at something like something like five to ten percent of hash power, but it's still not nearly as bad as actually you know supporting the whole thing. Is the idea. So. And the, this principle actually by itself it's not enough, right? It's only one, it's only one way of one approach of thinking about the problem. I mean, but it is an approach that sort of reasonably does work in the real world because Supreme Court judges don't end up, you know, deciding on whether this little bit this little guy that they clock they clocked this uh, this other woman in the in, in the subway should go to jail or not. Because that you know, just sort of gets solved at the lower level. So there's so I mean, the weakness, so one weakness, of, so DDoS ability, I guess, I will add it here. Um, fragility, another problem. So if no, if there is a DDoS attack and nobody raises the alarm, or if people get, you know, there's a DDoS and people get prevented from raising the alarm, then it becomes problematic. So, yeah, then the other problem is that it's, and, well, the strengths are that it achieves this sort of, it achieves this high level of implicit protection with little explicit surveillance. So a few nodes, for, a few nodes want so as, from an incentive standpoint, like if you will think of it from an incentive, incentive standpoint, basically, if I, as one of the few nodes that's working at initially, I could either, you know, I could either say pass or I could, or I could either try to attack or I could try not to attack. But then if I attack, then I know that the alarm is going to be raised and that the strength of a much larger network is going, is going to be me. And so I'm not going to try to attack in the first place. And so I'm not, and, and so this sort of larger mechanism that they get called too often. So it, it does, like the point is more, I guess, and it, the point is specifically probably more to fight exploitability than anything else. So the second principle is this idea of jury selection. So this is more of a statistical trick. So you randomly select nodes from a large set. So you have, you have 10,000 nodes, you randomly select 200 of them. And the theory is that an attacker would have, an attacker would need to take over like 25% of the entire 10,000 is having even a statistical chance of taking over a small set. Because it's all, because it's all randomly chosen, like you can't shoot, even though a, hundred no, a 200 nodes might be processing this transaction, you don't know which 200 are going to be. And so you as an attacker that have 200 nodes can't set yourself up in order to take advantage of this. Like you would have to basically do as much as almost taking over the network. So like both of these are imperfect approaches, right? And the idea is they would sort of combine them together so, like one of the things that one of the costs that you do have when you try and like follow this route is that you do lose elegance. You do lose elegance to some degree, and 
but what you gain is you gain this sort of idea that you would have much more, you would have this huge amount of implicit protection, but only a few nodes watch at a time. So why can't we rely on jury selection by itself, right? And that's an issue. So one strength is that it doesn't have a fragility problem. The weakness is that it has low depth. So with low depth, basically, theoretically speaking, a small number of users can be, uh, like, if you know that there's only 10 nodes that are, or 200 nodes that are processing this transaction, or that are validating this block, and you know that, then theoretically you could say, I'm going to bribe them this uh, some amount, and if they, in order to vote yes, even if the block is invalid, and they're all going to vote yes, and if that happens, then, the, you know, it's a very it's a very small cost to the attacker, but it still breaks the whole thing down. And it sort of gets around the statistical issue because we're sort of bribing them after the fact instead of trying to corrupt them before the fact. I mean, the thing is that bribing attacks are highly theoretical, so that is a you know, that is a reason a reason why it's so in the sort of more traditional fault tolerance model where you just say you know some attackers are Byzantine and some follow the protocol altruistic reason, this works fine because the attacker would need to have a large portion of everything in order to take over some of them. But in an environment where you're thinking about game theoretic incentives as well, the, you know, the, this set setup is not enough by itself, and so the idea is that this would exist basically just to augment it. So that's basically so that's basically the way that I think about it. How do you, uh, I, 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 I know the boss tried that without uh, Going on, but you said that you're going to select some nodes randomly. Yes. Anytime you do that, um, you have to think about symbol attacks and somebody who's you know. So by randomly, I mean I mean randomly for a pre-selected set of people who put up some particular security deposit. That's kind of assumed. Okay, gotcha. Um, all right. Well, then, yeah, then you have the standard problem of rule by the rich, basically, the people who own the most amount of stake can have a higher probability of being in that jury. Right. So that, yeah, that's, I mean, that's an issue of, that's a thing that people, an issue that people raise about proof of stake generally, regardless of whether it's scalable or not. Um, I mean, my positions on that are, well, first of all, number one, mining is exactly that much better. Um, number, number two is that it depends, and it really depends on, so by, its, by itself, you know, if you're trying to like meet if you're trying to make a cryptocurrency be egalitarian, it seems as though it doesn't really work. It doesn't really work. It doesn't really work too well, basically, because you know people need to have computers and need to have powerful computers in order to participate, no matter what you do. And so, what you want to achieve is you want to have the ownership be sufficiently decentralized initially. And like trying to and trying to accomplish that seems like a seems like a more reasonable approach. Yeah. Um, is jury selection, like when the jury decides, are they like unanimous or do you take the majority? You, know, you would take the majority, but you would raise the alarm if the majority is very high. Okay, because uh, one, one technique that I've been thinking, I've like talked to you and Vlad about, like that is an alternative, right. uh, it would be like you insist unanim unanim unanimity. Right. And, then, um, and then like if you are concerned about like attacks by like the, you know, like the top 25% uh, of stakeholders, you just like, Increase the jury size, and then like eventually you'll get you'll statistically get one on two. Right, but the thing with unanimity is that it makes it too and it, it, it does, certain. exactly. Yeah, it does. So yeah. Um, what happens if uh, the protocol is designed such that every five years everybody's account balance is set equal to a constant value? Um, <laughs> make a terrible economy. <laughs> <laughs> Realistically, people will just wait until year 4.99 and then they'll fork it. I mean, you, you can't solve every problem at once. So, you, yeah. you know, you may, it, it's like, it's fun to dream about that. But I think yeah. that you, well, you well, get a little too ambitious here for another talk. It's not ambitious. This is like making a paragraph of code that you can write. Let's not say that. socially viable. Let's save that for another talk. Well, you would know, reprogram people's minds not to care about that. Five minutes of yarn graph, you know. <laughs> Let, let's let's leave. Let's save that for another day. Yeah. Okay. So, data availability votes is this other interesting strategy. This is actually basically a way of achieving a hypercube-like thing with number one, much a much lower degree of interoperability. 
and, but number two, a very low degree of standardization. So this is actually a system where if you create a new protocol, your new protocol can join it. So the idea here is to separate the two parts of the, so to separate the two parts of block validation. So when you're validating a block, you're actually validating two things at the same time. First of all, you're validating that the block has all of its data available and that it came at a particular period, at a particular time. The second thing is you're validating that the block is correct, according to whatever, whatever blockchain rules you have. So let's assume that you have a magic oracle that solves the first problem. Let's assume we have a magic oracle that just knows, given a particular oracle root, whether or not the data you know, for the entire Merkle tree corresponding to that root is available in some sense, and what time it came in. Then here's your consensus algorithm. Only the first available block at any particular height is accepted. Well, only the first valid available block at any particular height is accepted. That's it. So whatever the block is right now, whoever the first is, who the person is to come up with a block that's valid and that has all the data available at the next height is going to, will be able to make that block. If you, if you try to make a fork, the fork is invalid by definition. So assuming your magic oracle is secure, this is secure. So how do we pull the magic oracle? So idea here is to basically just use jury selection and to use a sort of shelling vote thing. So the general idea behind shelling voting is that you would have, you would grab a big large consensus group and you would ask, ask, all, of them the, ask all of them the question, what is this block produced right now? And is the Merkle tree that originating, originates from the, from the block header fully accessible? So it, you know, is there any hidden data? And they vote on this, yes or no. Whoever provides the majority answer gets some reward. Whoever doesn't provide the majority answer doesn't get some reward. And so if you think that everyone else is going to vote honestly, you're incentivized to vote on this. So if shelling point works, then you could do this. Now, the thing that you could do to make it scalable is you say, well, I'm going to you know, randomly jury select some shelling, some jury of 20 nodes. If they fully, if they nearly unanimously agree, then great. If some of them don't agree, then you, you know, increase to 40. If you, they keep disagreeing, you increase to 80, you increase to 160, and so forth. So, like the general security condition here is that the, the percentage of attackers, the, the percentage of attackers that you want to be secure against from a DDoS standpoint, that's the percentage that has to that has to sort of altruistically follow the protocol because like. If you corrupt all 20 of them immediately, then it just looks to be anonymous, and so it's uh, and so you kind of have a problem. So one question is, can we remove the security assumption that this shelling vote mechanism for? Because as I'm going to as I'm going to actually say later on, this is surprisingly enough, you know, they do have some problems. So answer is yes. And the idea is that at the highest level of appeals court, we basically just require you to import the entire blog. You know, every everything in the Merkle tree going down to the block header, just import absolutely everything into the chain. And so, you, and the idea is that you know it's an extremely expensive process. The transaction of these four could be like a thousand dollars. But the point is that this, the point of this mechanism is not to happen. The point of the mechanism is to threaten to happen. And so, this sort of threat of secure ultimate judgment will sort of create the right incentives that back uh, that sort of back propagate and, and ensure that people have the incentive to vote correctly on each of the lower levels. So, and then for, for time stamping, you just, you know, the blockchain verifies the time stamp. So that's how you do that. That's how you solve both parts of this work. So what are the benefits of this, of this rather weird approach to consensus? So it's actually simpler than, than a hybrid view. It's, you know, it's simpler than saying, okay, we're going to have a bunch of vortices and you mine an edge and you're ever going to pick two of the random nodes because all you have is that you have this one master chain, you have this sort of voting mechanism on this master chain, and you would pick 20 random nodes, if they, and you would see what the result is. If they disagree, then you would increase, and you would increase, and if they completely disagree, then you would sort of import the entire block. And the other strength is that it actually requires you to standardize almost nothing. The only thing you have to standardize is your Merkle tree. So you have to say, okay, this particular chain is only going to accept Merkle trees that use SHA-3 and then use this particular format. If your Merkle tree doesn't use this format, you're screwed. If your Merkle tree does use this format, then congrats, you can join this mechanism no matter what your protocol is. Because the idea is that the, the data availability vote only cares about availability and the time. It doesn't care, but, you know, it doesn't care about whether it doesn't care about block validity. What cares about block validity is your consensus algorithm, which is that only the first valid available block at a height at a particular height is accepted. 
So if there are two blocks at some particular height and they're both available, then the first one's invalid, then the second one turns out to be the one that's valid. So that's just, you know, the, that's the rule according to which the block chain works. So weakness, you sacrifice interoperability. So, you know, you can't, you can't have one currency in all these mechanisms and you can't, and you can't easily send cross-chain messages. But you can theoretically, you know, send some cross-chain, come up with some mechanism, but it doesn't work too well. Uh, the other strength is because you don't have the same currency, you lose a bit of fragility. So if one thing breaks, everything else can be plugged off. So inclusion is basically scalable blockchains are possible, but you know it's hard. And there are a bunch of these really weird heuristics that you kind of have to rely on, you have to stack them all together. And, and you know, the idea is that hopefully the, you know all these different approaches and, Approaches cover all the cover all the bases and give you and give you this, give you a decent level of security assurances. Question of which which paradigm to use? You know, do we use this hub and spoke approach? Do we use the tree chains approach? Do we use the hypercube approach? Do we use this multi chain data availability voting approach? Um, and you know what parameters? There's probably a bunch of tweaks. You probably have to do a bunch of heavy testing. See exactly how possible DDoS attacks are. Yeah. So. <coughs> You know, the thing with DDoS attacks is that, like, I mean, theoretically, there's no I mean, there's you can't really profit from doing that unless you're like shorting doing something like shorting Bitcoin and sorry, no, shorting whatever currency comes up. So you only like you don't you don't need nearly as much as much security against them as you do against attacks that are actually trying to do something malicious. So that's well, you know, you still have to figure out exactly what parameters, you know, what param under what parameters, under what level of your threshold strength you make the alarm and so forth. So, yes? Uh, would it be possible to target a DDoS so it's specific to like specific contracts? So, so you have any Right, so if you target a DDoS against a specific contract, then what you'd be trying to do is you'd be trying to like raise, raise the alarm on every watt that processes anything to do with that contract, which, you know, you could do. And at some moderate cost, and you know uh, that contract would become less accessible for the period of time during which your attack continues, and eventually, you presumably, your attack would stop. That's so. Right. So, bonus section is uh, there is this interesting category of there's this interesting category of attacks. So, this this is an interesting attack on shelling point that actually Andrew Miller uh, pointed out a couple of weeks ago. Which basically points out that it actually relies on some extra econo extra economic assumptions that aren't just, you know, that, that aren't the sort of standard you know, a game theoretic equilibrium model. So the idea here, so the standard sort of way shelling point works is a sort of mechanism that lets you sort of import any kind of real world data into the blockchain. So let's say the question is, you know, is the weather today over 20 degrees? You can vote zero or one. And the votes that conform to the majority get a reward of P, and the other votes get a reward of zero. So if you expect everyone else to report the correct answer, then your incentive is to report the correct answer. So that's basically the key argument behind shelling coin. It's also the basic idea behind tr behind truth coin. So let's say the truth is zero. Attacker creates contract. So the attack creates a contract, and the contract says, if the majority votes zero, then I am going to bribe users P plus epsilon if they vote one. And if the majority votes one, then I'm only going to bribe users epsilon if they vote one. Now, let's see what the incentives are given the shelling point game plus the contract. So if you think the majority is going to vote zero, if you vote zero, then your incentive is then you would get a reward of P from the from the shelling point game. If the if you think the majority is going to go vote zero and you vote one, then the showing game gives you nothing, but the attacker gives you P plus epsilon. If the majority votes one, you vote zero, then you get nothing. And if the majority votes one and you vote one, then you get P from the showing game, you get epsilon from the bribe, and so you get P plus epsilon. So the thing that you notice from this nice little diagram is that actually, in all cases, regardless of what you believe the majority is going to vote, it is the dominant strategy to vote one, which is not the correct answer. And so because of that, one wins. And because one wins, the attacker doesn't have to bribe P plus epsilon, only has to bribe epsilon. So basically, the attacker can sort of 
over sort of corrupt the mechanism, spending no money. If the attacker is is able to first of all commit a war into spending a large amount of money necessary, and second to and second have this you know has this has this ability to make it to make a trust a, a trustworthy commitment to, 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 to pay it out conditionally, and if you know users aren't altruistic and are willing to accept bribes, so. It works if you if you add a sort of coordination failure assumption that coordination that sort of bribe attacks of this size can't happen, then it works. But you know it's clearly on substantially it's clearly on it's on rather shaky ground. So I mean this does apply to the Shelley Boy protocol, applies to the Shelley Boy protocol, but it also works against proof of work. So this is the interesting thing. So let's say that you securely promise you you make some kind of mechanism. It could be a contract. Or it could just be a you know a, a government that's that's you know that's uh, that has that wants to have have a reputation for act, for acting predictably. So you know even without blockchain, let's suppose ISIS promises to bribe 21.0 and 20. It pro starts a fork and it promises to bribe people 25.01 BTC if they mine if they mine on the fork and the fork loses and 0.01 BTC and the, if the fork wins. And so you know presumably you know. Doesn't even matter if ISIS is not a bunch of particularly nice people. All that matters is that people trust them to, with high probability, act predictably. And so, but obviously, you know, doing this on a separate contract, on a, a contract on the blockchain, is basically the gold standard. So, the idea here, once again, if there is a fork, and if the fork, you have to, if you think the fork is going to lose, then you expect, then if you vote. On the, on the main chain, then you get an expected reward of 25 BTC, and if you vote on the off chain, on the fork, you get an expected reward of 25.1 BTC. If you think the fork is going to win, then on the main chain, you have these. Uh, if you vote on the main chain, you would get an expected amount of zero, and if you vote on if you vote on the fork, the fork is going to win, and you get 25 BTC from the fork, plus from the block reward plus 0.01 BTC from the contract reward. So once again. Proof of work is corruptible at pretty much zero cost if you are willing to commit to if you're if you are capable of credibly committing to spending you know this number of dollars or like something like that. yes. Um, but there are so many miners. So how yep. are they going to who, who are they going to bribe? No, I mean, you don't need to bribe. You know, so this is one of the misconceptions. You mean. You might think that in order to bribe someone, like you have to like go and you have to like make a special deal with them, and you, and you have to just and, and, commu and communicate with them and so forth. The thing is, you don't. All you do is you just publicly put out this contract, and you just pu and you publicly put out this mechanism that everyone everyone can see the code, everyone can or everyone can see that you are going to do this, and you are going to automatically do this to whoever cooperates, and so they unilaterally make the decision from a game theoretic standpoint. That they're better off working with you. There's no, there's no communication involved. It's purely you know. Yeah. So, actually, I'm not even going to go through this. It's more complicated. But you know, conclusion is, you know, if your friends ever point you at this, so at this that wonderful Andrew Foster paper that talks about how proof of proof of stake is fundamentally broken because of nothing at stake problem, you know, proof of work doesn't has rests on somewhat shaky economic grounds as well. So. It's actually, you know, it's true. Crypto economics is tricky. So let's see if we can salvage Shelling Point from this attack. So here's what we're going to do. If there is more than 15% disagreement, then what we do is we say, we'll actually split the mechanism in half. We'll actually copy the contract. We'll have two contracts. Each mechanism has its own coin and, or shear or whatever you want to call it. Then you know it depends if, it, if it's just paid for paying transaction fees at the point. If it's some mechanism that somehow ends up getting yeah, dividends to share or whatever. So the theory is that once you have two children, on one child you would assume on one child you would say that you know zero wins, and so people who get zero get voted for zero get a reward fee. On the other side you'd say one win, you'd say one wins, and people who voted for one get a reward fee. So you would have both mechanisms. And so this is also assuming a sort of truth point like model where you have, where accounts get a sort of increased amount of reputation if they if they vote correctly and that reputation gives them increased influence in future rounds. So the theory is that of these two children, the higher value child 
gives the child the more honest users win because on that child, the more honest users are the ones that have a higher level of ownership and then have a higher level of reputation. And so, and the and, and the other and the, and the other argument is actually is that if the low, if the lower the value child wins, then it becomes the case that the mechanism is broken, and so in that case, the lower value child will have what, will have a much lower value. And so, because of these two arguments together, the higher value you know both these both of these children have have a coin, and the higher value child has a coin. Will will have a coin that has a house. Will just naturally have a coin that catches a higher market price. And users can just look at the market to determine which of these two children is, is the correct one to follow. So why do we do this sort of market selection approach instead of just using majority rule? I mean, the idea is that tricking a market requires 61% of that. So there's this interesting video on Futarchy that I think I'm, uh, where Robin Hanson, David Freeman, and I think the guy, the guy behind uh, Manifest Moldbug are, are debating on whether or not it's, whether or not it's viable. The Futarchy as a governance mechanism is viable, and one of the issues you bring up is this idea that if he wants to trick a market, like if you're listening to a market and using a market to make decisions, then tricking the market basically requires a 51% of the tax. Because if the true value of something, is, you know, if the if the market value that something is supposed to have is let's say five dollars, and then you as an attacker wants to force the value up to ten dollars, then okay, you force it up to ten, but then guess what? There is this ten dollar thing which is actually worth five dollars, and so everyone in the world has the incentive to jump on the market and start shorting it because they'll get an expected amount of profit. And so if he wants to, uh, if he wants to have more, um, if you want to keep the price at 10, then basically you have to provide more, you would have to keep on providing more funds than every other participant put together. So it's kind of a 51% attack mechanic. And the idea here is that even if the 51% attack succeeds, you know, there's going to be a few users that are tricked for a little while, but the attacker is going to be losing a lot of money, and eventually, if the attacker, when the attacker runs out of money, you know, the other mechanism or users are honest, that it'll just it'll bubble up to the top, and and this sort of fake mechanism drops to zero when the attacker goes broke. So, is this sort of fix translatable to the world? So this is actually somewhat interesting. So, it actually kind of is. So there's this idea that I came up with. Um, a few months ago, called exponential subjective scoring, where basically the idea is that you would, is that when you want it, generally if if you have a if you as a client you see a blockchain and you see a fork of a blockchain, the, the the fork that you would choose as being correct is the fork is generally just the longest chain. It's a chain that has the highest proof of work behind it. So the idea behind this ESS approach is that you would. When you're score, when you're calculating the score of a chain, you would you would take into account not just the amount of proof of work behind it, but you would also take into account the time at which you saw the blocks come. So if you saw this fork come 20 minutes before that fork, then you would give the, the second fork like a 2x penalty or whatever. So the idea behind this sort of mechanism is basically that it al it, it allows individual users, even if a fork looks, you know, su succeeds, it's Grows longer than the original fork. It still allows original users to stay on the original fork, and the only users that get tricked are basically the users that actually end up uh, that log on after the after the fork because they have no idea which of the which of the two which of the two are real and okay fine they get tricked temporarily. So the idea is that the original users would would, 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 stay, would stay on the would stay on the original chain. They would keep on mining it, and so eventually the attacker would. Presumably get bored because of his own attack would stop, and so the original and the original and the original blockchain would eventually get longer again. So that's that's kind of the, the basic theory behind it. Now, how does this translate into this sort of approach of listening to markets? So the idea here is that proof of work, uh, proof of work actually is a market, right? Proof of proof of work is a market. It's a, it is an open market in which anyone can. Can convert can sell their energy in exchange for buying in exchange for buying up coins. And when you see multiple chains, and when you're choosing which chain based on the, based on whether or not the chain is longer, what you're actually doing is you're saying you know the chain the chain is one chain is going to be longer than the other because more miners are voting on, are voting on that chain, and the reason why more more or more miners are purchasing coins on that chain in exchange in exchange for their power 
is because is because the is because that particular that particular chain has a higher value. Why does it have a higher value? Because you know because first of all it has a higher probability of being the main chain and, or eventually winning, and second because the whole blockchain mechanism would be discredited if, if a fork wins. So in a sense, and in a sense, what you're actually doing when you're choosing the longest fork is you actually are listening to a market where the market is the sort of one-way market of converting energy into Bitcoin in order to see which chain the market thinks is more valuable. And just like any other market, you can 51% attack the market. And But the theory is that if, if an attacker has a limited budget, it can only be 12 percent attacker for some period of time, then it actually makes sense for users to keep on but keep on voting on the original, keep on mining on the original chain if they expect that the attacker will eventually run out of steam. And you know, okay, fine, a few users might get tricked in the meantime, but eventually the original chain will sort of work out. So that's basically just so that's basically just a, a, a tiny sort of diversion that grows it into some of these sort of more advanced ideas of you know how we can make blockchains. Uh, survive, uh, survive under even more strict, strict conditions. So, yeah, you know, it's basically the scalability and the very, int very interesting things about Shelley Quinn's work presentation. Um, I promised updates about Ethereum. Um, I'll make it quick. I mean, planning to launch in March. Um, we're just about to launch POC8. We've launched POC7. We're in the phase where we're starting security audits. Security audits is basically, you know, uh, they're going to be going on through February or early March. Um, the idea is, and at the same time, or you know, Jeff is continuing to develop MIST. Gab and his guy, his, his team in Berlin, they're, fo and they're focusing heavily, on, heavily on, uh, on the networking side and trying to develop algorithms like Whisper and the B2B networking, networking platform. Um, so also working on Solidity. I'm continuing to, I'm continuing to work on Serpent and, and on Pi Ethereum. I just pushed a nice feature to Pi Ethereum today that actually lets you know, that actually lets you create like Python objects that sort of rep represent contracts and servants. It's kind of useful. It's on, on the wiki now. Um, so proof of work algorithm continu uh, continuing continuing uh, to progress nicely. Um, and almost almost getting re getting ready. I mean that's also going to be submitted to sent through a security review as well. Um, and yeah, I mean we're pretty close to the finish line. What can I say? All right. So hopefully you're willing to answer a few questions. Yeah. I got a I got a fun one for you. So um, Greg Maxwell was once uh, talking about uh, he he discussed the possibility of snarks. Yes. For scalability. So I think it's easy to think, I don't know, uh, Snarks are kind of a fancy cryptographic tools. They're basically a way of proving that you ran a particular program and got a particular output on it, and that proof could be very quickly verified without running the program yourself. Right. So. Yeah, I mean, they're useful, but the thing that they don't solve is the data availability problem, basically. <coughs> so. Yes, um, and if I could also add a criticism of, like, say, the uh, the, the most popular implementation right now is uh, zk snarks uh, out of the team in MIT. Do you know the name of the zk? I mean, there's Ali Bensasol is one of the guys behind it. And, <laughs> and so uh, the biggest problem with them compared to, say, like an Ethereum approach uh, is that uh, they um, can only do strictly bounded computations. So you must. So in order to like be able to like actually have like a zero knowledge proof of like um, of like one of these uh, one of these programs, you can't actually have like it be turn complete. You must have it, it like runs in a bounded amount of computing uh, time. At least that's like the current. That's, that's the limitation of the current implementations. Well, One thing that you could do is you could just repeatedly run it with like increase with like increasing powers of two of computational of computational step bounds, and then eventually. It works. <laughs> yeah, but then what if you? So how are you going to know that like it's actually going to halt? See, you have a gas cylinder. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, I mean, like that's right. I mean, it, 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 it's a. Uh, it, it, I mean, it's it, right now. It's like it's also super slow. That's like another problem with ZK servers. Uh, actually, I thought that they were. They're, they take six milliseconds to verify in like optimized mode on a computer. So they take a much longer amount of time to predict. 
groups. Yes. So like you could have them be in a mining algorithm, or like or you could add them as a sort of proof of work thing inside in the context of a proof of stake algorithm. But so I guess I was thinking that, that uh, Aaron Chomer, when he was here, he was imagining that they they could get rid of this, uh, for example, in their zero cache. He thought that, or at least one of the co-authors was thinking that they can get rid of the the some of the trusted startup things, right. and yeah. uh, that uh, at some point they could be a powerful yeah. tool. And the yeah. question so, was, so as far as the scalability, so. One of the things in terms of the way that zero cash, in the way that a lot of these kinds of like hyper anonymous coins work, is that they still keep a tree of like used indices, right? And so you would, and and that's basically how they keep how they keep track of you know whether or not a particular coin is being spent. So, and then you know, so nodes still end up storing a bunch of data for every, still end up storing a bunch of data for every transaction. Okay, well, I guess maybe we're getting a little bit too off topic here, yeah. but I guess uh, I'll, I'll ask you later about sure. about that. Yeah. So, other questions, please. Yes. Yeah, I got a so minor loophole and general question. I think we'll line up I'm researching about personal bitcoins, not not personally. Right. I know there's I know there's one project, I forgot the name, I think it might even be like based on my guys from this area that's trying to like do this this idea of like every person can issue their own coin. Um, I mean there's project I mean I guess Swarm is going to go into it. Swarm going to go into the whole, you know, people having their own coin thing. I'm not sure. Um, there's, I know there's one person. There's, there's, a, there's a couple of people that did their own, like, did the whole issue your own coin thing on Mastercoin. So like, there are experiments around it. It's still in that stage. Yes. Uh, this is sort of a naive question. Um, so I understand how the hypercube works is basically that uh, on a particular edge. I and basically, it's not less secure because I'm sort of benefiting from the fact that my two my two uh, ends of my edge are implicitly connected to the entire rest of the cube. Kind of. Um, so, does that change anything about uh, like if there you know are two you know there could be sort of two forks on different edges that are very far from each other. But right. So the idea is that there is still this concept. So there is still this concept of a header chain, right? That keeps track of all the headers. And so if there's a fork, there would be a fork in the header chain. So like that's the reason why these things only go up to like third of that. Right? Although tree chain does kind of a person who stack it on top of itself, so it does get to walk down, I think. Um, yeah, and they are kind of has, you know, there's still the tree chain still still has an ultimate central chain in there. Like, I did try to like I did try like earlier on to, to make hyper to make hyper to a central chain free, but it just didn't really work nicely. Yes. Um, so in the case of where a node is um, is trying to claim that its transactions aren't getting included in a block, <coughs> how does it prove that? It actually made the transaction in the first place. Like if if a mine if miners are trying to censor their transactions on that particular edge, right? You know, how how do they, how do they actually prove that they made the transaction in the first place? So, okay. So in general, a transaction is a document containing stuff. Does it also contain a signature signed by some private key? And it will also ha and it also in this case in, in this model it also has the idea of a project that is made that's intended to be the destination of, right? Then we have blocks. Blocks contain the block header, the block header points to a bunch of transactions, and it also points to like more of the work of the account state. So when you send the transaction, then if you're a miner on that block and you want to censor the transaction, then you can just choose not to include the transaction, right? And that's fine. And you know, it just doesn't get included until a miner with this another sensor reports it. Um, so it goes into the pool of like transactions waiting to be 
validated and then maybe if one miner basically pick yeah. it up. Like there's always there's yeah. always a, like every single mechanism has an implicit pool of transactions that need to be validated in some sense. <clears throat> okay. Yes. Not probably directly related to the scalability. It's kind of blog post about proof of stake versus uh, white clients. Yes. It's probably interesting. And uh, um, so my question is, what happens if an attacker can uh, totally hijack internet connection and provide totally fake data to the uh, client or to the device without broadcasting it to the main uh, network? Uh, will proof of stakes still be faithful? Um, it'll still have a hundred. So. The idea is the way that I envisioned the proof of stake algorithm, right, is that the the set of validators for one, the set of validators for a particular block is based on the block a hundred blocks ago, and so you have the situation where if the attacker starts feeding you invalid blocks, then the first hundred of for the first hundred of those blocks, even if they're invalid and even if nobody supplies challenges or whatever, then even in that even in that case, what you have is of the, att the attacker, or you still know that if those blocks are invalid, then there exists those signatures, and so it's going to be possible to create a proof of double signing. And so you know for those first hundred blocks that the signers, the signers of those, of the, of those blocks are going to get, are going to get the third block destroyed. Beyond the hundred blocks, you don't know, right? So, or you know, it could expand to past a thousand blocks. You could make it epoch-based, like I mentioned, closer to the end. Um, so. Well, yes, that's one point. Um, another point is that for our mechanisms that rely on that, that rely on these sort of you know com collaborative validation approaches, generally like a node is going to you are going to need to have some mechanism for checking if you're offline, and that could involve like trying to ping a bunch of uh, nodes that you were that were, you were unable that you were able to communicate to in the past. It could involve trying to you know commu trying to send a message to a bunch of websites that you that you were from in the past. Um, you could try like having the, you could like include a sort of second level protocol where you have a VPN to a bunch of other nodes. So it's that'll probably just involve a whole bunch of heuristic checks stacked on top of each other. It's it's, it's like, yeah, like, ideally you'd want sort of networking to be solved as a separate uh, uh, like as as separate a layer on uh, as separate a layer of consensus as possible. Or kind of validate whether. <laughs> Right. Uh, right. You can kind of validate. You can kind of validate because you have because you have the work. You can validate the work. Right. So with proof of stake, the idea is that if you were online up until a particular point of time, then you know what the validators are at that particular point of time. And so then, if you get shut off from the network, then you can you know that you know like for at least the first hundred blocks, you know that if the signatures from that older set of validators are provided, then you know that that set of thing. That that second set of signatures still has the same economic weight behind it. But it kind of doesn't work for, I don't know, devices which are offline most of the time until they like, the leave, for example. And they ask the user to provide some kind of headers. Uh, right, so. Block headers for the network. Yeah, so if your device is, well, it depends on how, it depends on how often the device is offline. Like if it's if it's offline if it's online less often than once every three months, then you have serious problems because three months is roughly, or you know whatever you set the deposit length to be. Um, if you're online more often, then actually not that much because even if it's like you know if if the last time you're online is three weeks is three weeks ago, then you start downloading blocks. Then you know that the blocks you've already downloaded are valid. Then for the new blocks that you start downloading, you start validating them. Then you notice that. The first hundred of those, you, you notice that you know, for the first hundred of those blocks, either they're signed by the validators that they're supposed to be signed by, and you know what validators are supposed to be signed by because those validators were decided a hundred blocks before when you were still online. And so, if the block was signed and and it's valid, then it's fine. If the block was signed but it's invalid, then you you know you have a you know all those all those deposits yeah, get taken away basically. Yeah. Um, to me, it seems that proof of stake um, is very severely flawed. Um, it's somewhat similar to proof of work, but the difference between them is that proof of work requires a little bit more effort uh, mm -hmm. to, to just handle. You have to like have a place.
use of the uh, <coughs> machines that do mining and all of that. Well, there's a proof of stake you need to have coins online securely as well. So. Right. <coughs> um, well, could you create, I mean, could you just delegate your signing to another key that isn't actually controlled? Mm -hmm. Well, no, the problem with that is that proof of stake works, works from, by having security deposits that can be taken away. And so if you have the signing key, then you have a key which can theoretically be used to double sign, and if you double sign, then your entire spot can be slashed. So a signing key is a key that allows you to like, destroy everything. So, but on the other hand, proof of stake seems like it would be ideal if you could actually have some notion of identity associated with it. Like if you could uh, guarantee that um, every single human, for example, who uh, is, is a potential voter is given exactly one vote. Uh, so is there any kind of research on how so to make that possible? Would it be, would it be okay if, if, if you had a coin that's based on simple proof of stake, but in the Genesis block like you, gave, you gave a coin to each person? I, I have no idea how you would do it. Right, and so, I mean, there is research on how you, so, in general, the thing, in, like, you, you don't want, you want to have a protocol rely on as few security assumptions as possible, and, this mechanism of giving one point to every to every human per year is not going to be compromised. It's a pretty it's a pretty tough security assumption to defend, especially in the long term. So, if you want to do like a one-time distribution based on a Genesis block, it's probably going to be much 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 easier than just you know having a rule included so in order to distribute new coins at each particular stage. So, in terms of how you can do it, there actually are interesting approaches. So. First of all, if you assume the existence of a secure capture-like mechanism, so some mechanism which is computer verifiable but can only be done practically by a student, then what you do is you say, at some particular time, based on like some blockchain randomness or whatever, let's say at like at let's say 10 o'clock, you generate a whole bunch of capture bundles. Then you say, whoever can for, for every single capture puzzle that you can solve within the next 20 minutes, you would get one unique identity token. And so the idea there is basically that, you know, it's, you as a, you as a human only have the ability to perform like a bounded, a, a bounded number of rounds of this particular protocol within 20 minutes. Yes. Well, but then that was like, that was the origin of the like, um, like recapture program was right. like, like spammers for, uh, we're like tricking people into solving capture problems so they could attack websites. And so then like it, uh, right. so the then, theory here is that because this is an event that's only 20 minutes, that's very rarely, mm -hmm. there would be a very, very large amount of interest in being <coughs> online to do it at this particular time. Okay. And so like the, 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 the idea is that the set, the set of people who would be, who would be trickable within that particular 20 minute time frame isn't that large. Okay. Yeah. That, that sounds like a neat idea. Does anybody do anything like that? Um, there's someone named Aaron Bale who has been who, you know, who's very interested in this sort of he's doing it some bit vote, which is like a big uh, cryptocurrency voting project. Yes. So my question is about this. Yes. And account mechanism Could you elaborate a bit how the accounts created? Okay, so in MIST the theory is that you would have, let's say, some number of private keys. Each private key would, cor would correspond to an account, and so it would, you know, like, you know, it's kind of mo it's kind of modeled on the you know how the way that Google sign in generally works when you have multiple Google accounts that when you open up some new page it says you know which account you want to sign in with, except here there would also be an option of creating an ephemeral <laughs> one-time account just for this application. So you know that's basically how it would, how it would probably end up appearing from a user interface standpoint. Alright guys, any, please. Um, yeah, I guess my question is kind of around the security reliability mm -hmm. standpoint. But is, there, is there any need for uh, node balancing from a geopolitical standpoint, perhaps a time zone standpoint for protocol? Um, from a um, I mean, the time zone standpoint probably doesn't matter too much just because uh, you know, the internet, the latency to go around the world is like less than 500 milliseconds anyway. And geopolitical standpoint, it, it is a legitimate concern. I um, mean, unfortunately, there's no way to say to do proof of not, not everyone being in China, just because at the very least, everyone who is in China could just run the entire algorithm through a VPN. 
Um, so it's the best that you can probably do is come up with a mechanism that doesn't rely on any particular like specialized thing. So the problem with Bitcoin ASIC mining, for example, is that all the factories are in China, and so the whole thing is, you know, high, ends up being highly centralized inside of China to a large degree. Whereas if you do something like proof of stake, you know, there's no particular country that's particularly more interested in holding currency units than other countries. It's a pretty universal human thing that we want to do for some reason. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about why orphan blocks are an issue when you're trying to get the block size or the block time uh, so so fast? And they are an issue, but basically, so there's a, so the idea behind the ghost protocol that we're using a variation of is that if uh, is that there, is an orphan blocks end up still contributing to the proof of work strength of a particular chain. And the way they do that is basically you can sort of reintroduce the header into a future block. And so the blockchain still benefits from the whole different blocks, right? And then, there's an, and then that also helps uh, fight centralization risk or, uh, because you end up rewarding the miner. Yes? Have you uh, heard of Tezos? And do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, Tezos, that's the, block, that's the blockchain protocol that's, tr that's trying to like have all of its code be written in a, if written in a particular language so the blockchain like has a has the ability to update its own code essentially. Yeah. I mean I think it's pretty really interesting and worthwhile and I'm looking forward to seeing what comes out of it. So uh, yes. Oh. Yeah, another general question. Um, what do you see in terms of uh, your perspective? I mean like so what happened with Bitcoin in China run up last year or two years ago? Uh, I mean from a consumer adoption perspective, the thing that cryptocurrency really needs is it needs an application that people will use because that application it actually does something useful to people. So, I mean, right now, you know, there's merchants accepting Bitcoin, but the primary thing that, it, but to a large degree, the primary benefit of Bitcoin seems to be that you know it's it's a it's a cool tech thing and it's and if you have a particular ideology, then it's a way of expressing your support of that ideology implicitly. And so, so I mean, that's, it, that's, that's nice, but it's never really going to get mainstream adoption. And what you need to get mainstream adoption is you need to figure out what is a fundamental advantage that the technology provides that, you know, that's potentially valuable to everyone. And then to create you know, a product or an application that's based on that advantage in some way. So in the Bitcoin, there's international remittance. That seems to be an, an, an interesting avenue. Um, with Ethereum, I, I mean, I suspect there's there's a few routes. It's like there's a, a lot of these sort of a lot of these uh, decent, decentralized app, applications in file storage, cloud computing, or or, or whatever else are interest or interesting. Even some, even something like mesh networking is essentially quite valuable. Yes. I just realized that. Um... The capture thing that you described you could also be used for coin generation. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it could. I mean, the reason thing, yeah, and the the, the the reason why I'm not comfortable with using it for coin generation is because it's an extra security assumption, so it's a big hit to the base level of the protocol, and you want to have as few of those as possible, especially when there are these really, really shaky economic assumptions about whether or not a particular capture algorithm is breakable. Right. Right. About whether capture algorithms. Yes, I, I agree. <clears throat> so, some, but some thought, like we can yeah. put on that. Yeah. So, okay. So, one way that you could, one way that you could make a future proof is you just have every round of the captcha vote on what the next vote on what the algorithm for the next round of the captcha is going to be, and you can sort of use the future proof because it keeps on updating itself. But, but once again, you know, it's generally when you're designing like fundamental base layer protocols, you know, don't want you know, like you don't want to just Bake in all these extra mechanisms. Well, well okay, so there, there is one desirable feature of that, though, which is that right now, one of the biggest problems that Bitcoin has is obtaining Bitcoins. Yes. And that to obtain a Bitcoin, you have to go to a centralized surveillance build place yes. uh, to get those. Whereas if you sell Bitcoin, uh, you wouldn't have that problem. Right. So, I mean, one interesting avenue for, for acquiring crypto tokens in general might actually be the sort of decentralized cloud computing platform just because you know if you can rent earn a few cents an hour to rent out your hard drive, I mean chances are it's not going to be much, but it but it will be enough to be transaction fees. I mean if that's not possible then yeah. You know someone could so 
someone could end up doing this kind of coin that someone could end up so what could end up happening is that someone you know Ethereum launches there's Ether then someone will end up creating this coin that gives off units to everyone and then it's and, and it will end up happening that because everyone has so many people have units of that coin merchants start accepting it and it, it sort of gets a network effect all of its own and then it gets really popular and then if he wants to get ether then you'll just you know collect your your your, uh, your annual dividend of these coins and then and then to convert them over and that'll be like the entry the entry of cryptocurrency in general. So I mean, theoretically well actually theoretically the thing is that currencies generally currency new cryptocurrency protocols generally wants to have a wider distribution, right? You don't want to launch a new coin with only a hundred people having, you know, having some having tokens on it. And one theory that I have is that if these sort of if these sort of decentralized mechanism mechanisms of proven identity exist, and if they're proven to be reasonably reliable, then new protocols will start sort of bootstrapping their genesis, you know, their genesis block off of those off of those mechanisms, and they'll sort of start growing from there. And then because of that, you'll have the situation where every single person in the world will be able to, you know, get a tiny amount of a whole bunch of crypto tokens basically for free. Because sort of ties it sort of ties into my general ideology that I think from an egalitarian perspective, I don't really think that any one particular protocol is going to be really be capable of being particularly egalitarian. I think if we want egalitarianism we need to sort of look at the entire ecosystem of protocols. <laughs> Okay, one more question, yes. and then what do you think? Yeah. One more. What are your thoughts on Eris Industries? Eris Industries. The Eris project. Yeah, I know the Eris project. I mean, it's it's so the the core the core idea of having like block, of having blockchains with with uh, where, where you can actually set the consensus parameters seems very, uh, seems very very promising and. Uh, and it's interesting that they're trying to, the particular interesting thing is how they're trying to also specifically target the weird space of blockchains that have administrative permissions. So you end up like having architectural <coughs> decentralization but not political decentralization. And so you end up having like the costs, you know, you end up having like some of the benefits and some of the costs but not all of them in the right industries where that's useful. So I mean it could end up proving to be a useful competitor to uh, you know, something like Rebel for all we know. You know, I'm looking forward to seeing what they can do. Okay, uh, so if we talk, I'm, I'm thinking that you'll be around, yes. and uh, people can come talk with you and ask questions. Uh, is there anything else that uh, we've missed that uh, we need to hear from? Any any fun updates? You, you're uh, you're around uh, for in the area for uh, like off and on, so <coughs> if it's at least possible we can have another meetup with you. Yeah, I mean, the updates I've, I've already given mine. I mean, welcome, welcome to 2015. Hopefully, it'll be a fun year. Okay, very good. <laughs> All right.